Well, today we are going to be partaking of the beautiful, the beautiful and pure milk of the Word. Uh, basically, what I wanted to do today is I wanted to carry on the theme that we had in my last message. And if, if you weren't here for that, the theme was pretty simple. We were, looking about, we were looking at the beautiful ministry of Yeshua. That's what it was all about. We were looking at specific characteristics that Yeshua possessed, that he had. Characteristics of which the Jewish people were actually waiting for. They are waiting for. Remember, the Jewish people, they had expectations in mind of exactly what the Messiah would look like when he came. Exactly what the Mashiach would do when he came. They're waiting for a Messiah to come and bring them hope. They're waiting for a Messiah to come and bring them salvation. They're waiting for their Messiah to come and heal their broken hearts. To literally bust open the prison doors and set the captives free. And I showed evidence of these things that they were expecting. We went to the prophet Isaiah. We saw Isaiah 6-1. We saw Yeshua quoting Isaiah of himself in Luke 4. I took you to the caves of Qumran and showed you that document called the Messianic Apocalypse. Literally, in that document, watching it outline characteristics. These are the things that they are waiting for. The expectations they had of their Messiah. Of which we read, He would open the eyes of the blind. Right? He would raise the dead. The poor would have the good news preached to them. And wouldn't you know it, all these expectations, they were found in the Messiah Yeshua. The blind did receive their sight. The lame walked. The dead were raised. The very things that the Jewish people were expecting were the very things they experienced when Yeshua came in the first century by His hand. Make no mistake, Israel was waiting for an earth-shattering moment in time where their king, the king of Israel, would finally come and He would come in ultimate power. He would come with total authority. This is exactly, when you read the stories in the gospel, this is exactly how Yeshua came. His ministry was a ministry of power. It was a ministry of authority. A power and authority of the likes that the world had never seen before. Nothing like it. We covered John chapter 9 in the last message. What did we talk about in John chapter 9? We looked at that scenario of the blind man. Do you remember what he said? This is what the blind man said. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone should open the eyes of one who was born blind. Unbelievable power. This is how Yeshua came. You go back a couple of chapters in John chapter 7, we read about the, 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 the um, chief priests and the Pharisees. They send out their officers. Yeshua is causing havoc among the people. So they send their officers out to go take Yeshua into custody. The officers, they walk out there, and guess what happens? As they walk up there, they heard the words of the Lord. They heard Yeshua speaking, and you know what it did? It terrified them. They were terrified to the core. Instead of taking them into custody, they go back empty-handed. And when they arrive, the chief priests and the Pharisees are looking, why have you not brought him? And you know what they say? Because no man ever spoke like this man. They were cut to the heart. They were pierced. They had never heard anyone speak like this man. Why? Yeshua spoke with authority. He spoke differently than anyone else who was before Him. You think about all the righteous men that existed. You think about Noah. You move on, you look at uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You look at guys like Moshe, Moses. All of these guys spoke differently than Yeshua. Because Yeshua spoke with authority. Let me build upon this. Let me give you a couple examples of how the people responded to Yeshua's power. I want to show you this because we need to have perspective before we get into today's story, which is in Acts, uh, the, in Acts chapter 3. So let's build this a little bit. We're going to go to Mark chapter 3, verse 7, follow along. But Yeshua withdrew with his disciples to the sea. 
And a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Yushalayim, and Edomia, and beyond the Jordan. They're coming everywhere. And from those entire in Sidon, a great multitude. When they heard how many things he was doing, they came to him. Literally, they're coming from every direction. They're coming to him. Great multitude. And then we continue in verse 9. So he told his disciples um, that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. Think about that for a second. Yeshua has to give his disciples special instructions. You guys got to prepare a boat. You got to get me offshore because they're going to crush me. When the masses get here, they will crush him. Just think about that. Why? Why would they do that? For he healed many, so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. Man, you you, you think about what Walmart looks like on Christmas Eve, right? As the people are running over each other to get to big screen TVs. Let me tell you something. That is nothing compared to what is happening here. That is nothing. They are coming from every direction to do what? To go and just touch him. They just want to touch him. Why? Why did they want to touch Yeshua? Because of the power. It was because of his power. That's what they knew. He had power. He came in power and he came with authority. Let me give you another example. Going to the Gospel of Mark in chapter 1, the scenario is this. There's a leper, he comes to Yeshua. And listen to what the leper says. I didn't put it up here. But the leper presents himself to Yeshua and says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So imperative you catch what he said. There was no question in his mind, in his heart, what Yeshua could do. But if you are willing... You can make me clean. Well, Yeshua says, I am willing. Be cleansed. That was the end of it. He was immediately made clean. His leprosy went away. Now, the next thing that happens is peculiar. Yeshua actually gives this man specific instructions. And I want to show you this. In Mark 144, and he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. What peculiar instructions are these? I mean, this is the manifestation of the power of the living God. He has been made clean. Why would you try to keep this secret? This is glorious, right? Well, as we continue, you're going to find out exactly why. But go your way, show yourself to the priests, and offer your cleansing, uh, for your cleansing, those things which Moshe commanded as a testimony to them. Verse 45. However, now let's just see if this guy follows Yeshua's instructions. He went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Yeshua could no longer openly enter the city. You want to know why he commanded him to keep quiet? Because just the word of his power going forth, it spread like wildfire to where he had to go hide. He couldn't even walk openly in the city. And another, you you can go back to John as well. You go back to John chapter 6 and and you read there. This is an amazing thing that happens. There's a miracle that takes place. Yeshua turns five loaves, two fishes. He feeds 5,000 people with this miracle. And what's so fascinating is, and I'll just, I didn't put it up here. I'll just go there real quick. What's so fascinating about this is when they saw this miracle, When they saw what he did, we read the following. And this is what it says. There are many of the disciples when they heard this, says this is, um, oh, I'm sorry. Here we go. This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. Therefore, when Yeshua perceived that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king. Listen to that statement. So, What he did is he fed 5,000 with five loaves, two fish. The people there that witnessed it, they said, there's no question. What were they identifying? The power. 
There's no question. He is the prophet who comes into the world, and it is explicit when you go there. What did they say? Yeshua knew they were about to come and make him Melech. They were going to make him king because they knew exactly what he had done. It was kingly. This is exactly what they were waiting for. Power. It's awesome. And then we continue in this, verse 45. So that Yeshua could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places, and they came to him from every direction. In other words, the fame of Yeshua, I think I've laid this out pretty well, the fame of Yeshua could not be contained. His acts of loving kindness could not be kept secret. Understand, this is the natural effect of the power of Yeshua, the power of God. Let me further put this into perspective for you with Yeshua's own words. As he's speaking to his disciples, listen to what he says. In Matthew 13, 16, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For surely I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. You ponder that statement. He talks about all the righteous men that these men had grew up learning about, hearing about in the synagogues. The prophets of God, prophets of the likes of Samuel, Elijah, Moses... What does Yeshua say? They desired, they craved, they yearned for something. It was Him. It was to see Him manifest His power. All the righteous men and the prophets that we read about in Scripture, they all had one desire. They had a craving. And that was to see what the apostles saw, to hear what they heard. Everything that the Jewish people were waiting for had finally arrived with the coming of the Messiah, Yeshua. Keep in mind, his ministry was not just something that was uh, uh, constricted to the physical realm. It went far beyond that. It went into the spiritual realm as well. How many times do we read about Yeshua having confrontations with demons? How did the demons respond to Yeshua's authority and power? How did they respond to his presence? Did they come to have a chit-chat? They fell down and worshipped Him, crying out, You are the Son of God. And what's so amazing is just with a word, Yeshua opened His mouth, and immediately they had to flee. He opened His mouth, and immediately they had to subject themselves to His command. How awesome is that? Yeshua, He is a man of power and authority. Let me give an example, one of my favorite examples in all of Scripture of authority and understanding Yeshua. In Matthew 8, we read the following. Now, when Yeshua had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Now, what's interesting is, is the centurion can't help his servant. Clearly, no one else could help the servant. Where does the centurion turn? He turns to Yeshua. And in verse 7, Yeshua said to him, I will come and heal him. Yeshua agrees to go with this man and heal him. Now listen to what the centurion says. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. This is what he says. Only speak the word and I know my servant will be healed. Why does he think this? Let's look at this. This is amazing. And verse 9, For I also am a man under authority. He gets it. Having soldiers unto me, I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Yeshua heard it, he marveled. He marveled and said to those who have followed, Surely I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Here's the point I want you to understand. Here's the point I want to make. Something absolutely necessary. This man understood the power and authority of Yeshua and he reaped the dividends for it. When he asked, he received. He asked in faith because he did not doubt that Yeshua could do what he said. 
He didn't even need to come to the house. Speak the word. The centurion saying, everything is subjected to you, my Lord. When you speak, it will be done. It is just awesome. But here's another point that I want to point out. When Yeshua died and rose from the grave and he ascended to the Father, Yeshua's ministry didn't cease to exist. The power and authority it didn't just evaporate into thin air. Actually, what we find, it was just the opposite. When Yeshua ascended to the Father, his ministry, his legacy, his power, it continued through his apostles. Yeshua empowered his disciples so that they could go out to the world and bear witness to his resurrection. And the story we're going to look at today, it proves this fact. So with that said, I want to take you to the third chapter of Acts, and we're going to begin our story for today. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's room, womb. Now ironically, what did we read about in John chapter 9? The man that Yeshua healed, he was born blind. So he was blind from the mother's womb, correct? Here we have a lame man from his mother's womb. He has never walked. Now let me put this into perspective. This man is over 40 years old. Okay? He's not 5 years old. He's not 2 years old. He is over 40 years old. And so we read, He was carried, the lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Think about this. They put him at the gate. This was common. This is what they were doing with him. Well, the guy's over 40 years old. He became more of a fixture of the temple than anything. Everyone that came into the temple knew who he was. There was no question about this. And you're going to see this to be true. So he's laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John go to, uh, seeing about to go into the temple, ask for alms. That's the whole point of why he's there. We continue in verse 4. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. And the name of Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So vital to acknowledge exactly what just happened here. Peter spoke the name of Yeshua with his mouth. Why? Because that is where the power is. It is in His name. And through Yeshua's power, through His authority, this man who was lame from the womb, he's going to walk for the first time in his life. First time ever. We continue in verse 7. And Peter took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking leaping and praising God. Verse 9. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. They were left in awe. They knew who this man was. You remember that marveling that the people experienced when Yeshua walked the face of the earth? It didn't end with his ascension to heaven. It continued on. Yeshua's power continued to be manifested. A power that shows loving kindness. A power that shows compassion. A power that sets the captives free. We are not cessationists. I can tell you that. This is the power of his name. It's the power of Yeshua's name. Moving on to verse 11. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John. I I find this kind of funny. He's holding on to Peter and John, and you kind of put yourself, you know, I I read this a few times, you kind of put yourself in this scenario. Well, if I hadn't walked for 40 years, two guys come up to me, I'm expecting to get something from them. They profess the name of Yeshua over me. I start walking, yes, Peter and John, you are my two new best friends. I am going to hold on to you. You're not going anywhere. I love you. Okay? Amen? Amen? So look at this guy. He's brilliant. He's hanging on to Peter and John. All the people, listen to this, 
all the people ran together to them. Notice it does not say that they walked or they casually strolled on out of curiosity just to see what was going on. It actually says they ran. In the Greek, it's synedramen. It literally means to rush in. This is a stampede in the temple. Put this into perspective. The people are rushing in upon Peter and John in the porch, which is called Solomon's. And why? Well, we're told. They're greatly amazed. They're left in awe. Now again, I want to point out, notice here, the same response that Yeshua received when he went out healing those in need is exactly what Peter and John are receiving here. Exactly. Although Peter, when he sees this, he responds, he ends up responding to the crowd differently than Yeshua for obvious reasons. But look at what, Yeshua, what Peter does. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people. Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us? He noticed something. They were piercing with their eyes, Peter and John. They were looking intently at them. As though by our own power. You get that? By our own power of godliness, we made this man walk. Notice here, Peter doesn't delay for even a second. We have so much to learn just from this passage right here. We have so much to glean as believers in Yeshua. Peter doesn't delay for a second. He immediately seeks to remove all attention from himself. And he puts the spotlight on Yeshua. Peter isn't under delusions of grandeur. Peter knows that he doesn't have the power to do anything like this. He knows that he could never, of his own will, make this happen. So rather than deliberate and to step back and embrace the glory, the amazement of the people as they looked at them, what does he do? He does the exact opposite. He puts the spotlight on the appropriate person, Yeshua, seeking to give him glory rather than to receive it. And this is something that we need to look at. We need to learn from in regard to those who want power to flow through them. Do you want power to flow through you? You need to be humble. Amen? You need to be humble. God will not use the arrogant. He will not use those who exalt themselves above others. Know this, and this is scriptural, God will not give his glory to another. It will not happen. You want to do mighty things for the kingdom of God. You want the power of God to move through you. You need to humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Let him exalt you. And I promise you, you will be used in a mighty way. Now, Peter, he's going to go on to tell these people who are standing in awe of what happened, exactly how it happened. Peter's a man that's going to capitalize on this situation because one thing is in view for him. He wants to bring glory to Yeshua. You see his heart. Now look at what he says. The God of Afraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Yeshua, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are all witnesses. Now, I just want to stop here really quick, just because of the nasty history of anti-Semitism and the church's portrayal of trying to condemn the Jews for killing Yeshua and manifesting anti-Semitism. I do want to just point out briefly that, and we're not going to get to it, but as you go further on in Acts, Peter goes, yet, brothers, I know you did this in ignorance. He knew that they did him in ignorance. And furthermore, if you would just turn one page to the next page, as you come to Acts 4, Peter condemns all men for putting Yeshua on the cross. Pontius Pilate, Herod, the Gentiles, and the Jews. Because why? Because Yeshua died for all of us. Amen? I'm responsible for the reason he had to go to the cross. This should not be turned into an anti-Semitic uh, thing. Amen? All right. So moving on to verse 16, getting to the point. And his name, through faith in his name, he gets to the point of how this man received healing. 
And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness and the presence of you all. Peter reveals the source of the healing. The source is Yeshua. The power is in Yeshua through faith in his name. Again, you want to experience the power? Guess what? you got to go to the source. There's no other way but through Him, through the faith in His name. Now, moving on, we're just going to skip ahead in this story for the sake of time. I want to jump ahead a few verses. And coming to Acts chapter 4, verse 1, this is where things are going to begin to take a turn. And this is what it says. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached Yeshua, the resurrection from the dead. Now this is interesting, because several things are noted here. Several reasons why this is problematic for the chief priests, for the Sadducees. Why is this problematic? Well, notice here in verse 7, they're disturbed. Disturbed, why? They taught the people, and preached Yeshua, the resurrection of the dead. Now, you got to know your characters here to understand why they're so disturbed. But if you look here, here we have the priests, right? These are some of the people mentioned in this passage, the people in the group. What were the priests supposed to do? Most people would say, well, they're just responsible for the temple services. Wrong. The, the job of the priest was not just to have to, to take care of the temple services. It was more than that. They were the ones that were supposed to be teaching. They were supposed to be the teachers of Torah. At the highest level, the Kohanim were supposed to fulfill this task. They were supposed to give understanding. Yes, you have the Perishim, you have the Pharisees going out. They were running synagogues. They made up part of the Sanhedrin. They too, what did they teach? They taught Torah. But primarily, at the highest level, it was to come from the Kohanim. This was their job. And what are Peter and John doing? They're teaching. This can be problematic. You can see how this can be problematic. But not only that, what are they preaching? They're preaching in Yeshua the resurrection of the dead. Well, this is a problem for these characters, the Sadducees. Sadducees, if you understand anything about their theology, they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And here you can see they're causing quite a commotion here because of what they're teaching and what they're preaching. They're they're messing with the theology of the Sadducees. And it's right here where the situation reaches in this story. It reaches its precipice. The leaders can no longer allow this type of activity to go on, which brings us to our next verse in verse 3. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day. For it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Understand, this is the direct result of none other than the power of his name. The power of Yeshua. When his power moves, things happen. Miraculous things take place. People by the masses, think about this, people by the masses are going to come into faith in Yeshua when His power moves, exactly as we see it happening here. Now, because thousands, I mean quite literally thousands, are coming into the faith, we find the leaders have compounded the problem. They have a compounded problem here on their hands. The message of Yeshua cannot be contained. It's simply spreading like wildfire. So because of this, the leaders get together and they talk about what to do about all this. And we read in verse 5, And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Anas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in their midst, they asked, By what power... Or by what name have you done this? You see the question? What power or by what name have you done this? 
we go on to verse 8. Peter, filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if this day uh, we are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Yeshua HaMashiach of Nazareth, Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. Peter comes out and tells him exactly how this took place. The name, it was by the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. That's how this healing happened. And then he goes on. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Peter's quoting Psalm 118.22 here. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. You think about that statement. Peter just articulated for us the most important principle in all of Scripture. There is no other name under heaven given by which we must be saved. He is the only way to help you further appreciate the gravity of what Peter just said. Let me take you to Paul's epistle to the Romans. He says the same thing. He says it a little bit differently and, and, and begins to blossom, if you will. You get this blossoming of understanding. In Romans 10.9, Paul says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Yeshua and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. That is the power of His name. It wasn't a question for Paul. You do this. You put your faith and hope in Yeshua and you can lock it, seal it. You are going to be saved. And then he says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse 11. For the Scripture says, I love Paul and I love Peter because they go back to the Tanakh to prove their point. Whoever believes on Him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon Him. Now this is the highlight right here. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Understand something. It's critical. Paul, he is quoting from the prophet Joel. In verse 13 here. This is an actual statement right out of Joel 2. But what's so fascinating about this particular passage is that Paul quotes this passage in the context of Yeshua. And when you understand this, well, it really is something to behold. Because if you read this passage in the Hebrew, Paul's statement here becomes much more dramatic than what you're even getting in the English. When you read it in the Hebrew, it becomes much more dramatic. I say this because when you read it in the Hebrew, you realize that the word used here for Lord... It's not Adonai or one of the other generic terms. It is yod heh vav -He. It is the Tetragrammaton, the sacred name of God, Yahweh or some pronounce Yehovah. So when you look at this, Paul is quoting Joel 2 in the context of Yeshua. Understand what's happening here. This puts Yeshua on a whole different playing field. It puts... Him on a whole different level of power and authority. This isn't just a Samuel. This isn't just an Elijah. This isn't just a Moses or King David. He is exalted much, much higher. And it's statements like this, when you see the apostles, Peter makes it too, but when you see the apostles making statements like this, it reveals to us who Yeshua really is. It reveals his true divine nature of literally being a chad with his father, being one with his father. And when you understand this concept, you quickly realize something. Something that is so important for your faith. Yeshua has no limitations. Don't give him any. All the men that walked the face of the earth, from Noah onward, Moshe, David, all of them had limitations. Yeshua has none. There is nothing too hard for him. Everything is subject to him, whether in heaven or on earth. 
Just listen to these words of Paul in Philippians. Therefore God also has highly exalted Him and given Him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Yeshua, the name of Yeshua, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those of the earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Yeshua HaMashiach is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, this gets really dramatic when you look at this. Yeshua HaMashiach is Lord. In the Greek, the word used is kurios. The very word that when they took the Tanakh and they translated it into the Greek Septuagint, this was the word used to translate yod heh vav -Hey, the Tetragrammaton. It's a lot more dramatic when it's coming from Paul and really in the depths of where he is coming from when he says every tongue should confess that Yeshua HaMashiach is Lord. Think about what he is saying. And what is it? To the glory of God the Father. Now, let me take it a step further. The impact of this passage really hits you on a whole other level when you realize that Paul, these aren't his own words. He's quoting Isaiah 45, a passage that is explicitly, go back and read it, it is all about God. It is all about yod heh vav -Hey, the Tetragrammaton. This is the person in view when it's read in Isaiah 45. So when I go to Isaiah 45, all who call upon the name of Yahweh will be saved. When I come to Philippians, Paul says, everyone who called uh, the, uh, the name of Yeshua, every knee is going to bow. Okay, I go to Isaiah 45, every knee is going to bow to Yahweh. I come to Philippians, every knee will bow to Yeshua. Think about who he is. Think about his power. Why do I share these things with you? I want to build your faith. We need faith, amen? I want you to understand exactly what the centurion understood about Yeshua. Exactly what Peter understood about Yeshua. Exactly what Paul understood about Yeshua. He is the power above all powers. He is. He has ultimate authority. And my advice is embrace the power. Embrace it. Embrace Yeshua. And I assure you, you will be saved. And it's more than that. When we truly embrace Yeshua, all of these beautiful stories that we read about, all these miracles that are happening, the visions, the dreams, the healings, the pouring out of the gifts of the Spirit, when we put our faith in Him, like the apostles did, there's one expectation for us, that these things are going to be manifested on a very intense level. Amen? I'm getting back to our story in Acts. Remember John and Peter, they've been brought before the Sanhedrin. They've been put on trial by the leaders. Not just because of the healing, but rather because of the, the things that they're doing. The teaching and preaching the gospel of Yeshua. And so, we come to verse 15. Verse 13, rather. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. Are they talking about going to Greek school, secular intellectualism, academia? This is not what they're talking about. They're talking about in yeshiva. They're talking about in their own schools. Being brought up in Judaism. Being brought up in the faith. The faith of Israel. Being at the feet of Gamaliel. Or Gamaliel. Like Paul. Apostle Paul was an expert. He was trained. He was educated. But these men, they're looking at John and Peter, and they're marveling. They're marveling at the fact that they are uneducated. They are untrained. And listen to this next statement. And then they realized that they had been with Yeshua. That is the final conclusion. It was that they had been with Yeshua. Yeshua, let me tell you something. There isn't a more powerful testimony that you could have than that. Think about it. When people talk about you behind closed doors, is it that they know you've been with Yeshua? Is that the testimony? 
Is that the testimony we bear? There's no higher testimony that you could have than what John and Peter were given. Our actions, the deeds we do, the words we speak should reverberate and leave people with only one conclusion. You've been with Yeshua. This is powerful. It's the most powerful testimony that we can bear. Now continuing on, Again, we'll reread verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Yeshua. In verse 14. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them. Here's the guy still holding on to him. Here, they're just hilarious, right? He's still hanging on to him. They were spent the night in jail. He's still hanging on to him. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. This is what the power of Yeshua does. It leaves people speechless. So what did the leaders do? How do they handle this? Well, we continue in verse 15. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, okay, they sent them away. They conferred among themselves saying, what shall we do with these men? For indeed, a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. I love this part of the story. The power of God is undeniable. They couldn't deny it. There were too many witnesses. People coming and going to praise God in the temple to pray to the Lord. They saw this man. He's over 40 years old. It could not be denied. And we go on to verse 17. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. See what's happening? Speak to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Yeshua. It is so fascinating to me. What do the leaders go after? They go after the source of the power. The very source that produced the miracle in the first place. They go after Yeshua. They want to ban His name from being preached. Can't speak it, you can't teach it. And make no mistake, this is the work of the enemy. The adversary. This is a tactic, a strategy of Satan. Why? Satan knows the power is in his name. For him to keep his captives firmly in place, to keep his prisoners in a state of bondage and oppression, he has to shut down the gospel of Yeshua. Think about how powerful it really is. When you speak the truth to your neighbor, when you preach life, you speak life through the name of Yeshua, Respect the power. Let me share with you a dream I have. Most of you have heard this from me, but it applies to understanding the power of the name. Many years ago, I just started keeping the Sabbath, probably for about a year. I was newly married. Uh, my world was spinning. It was, spiritually speaking, it was so intense. You need to understand, I was spending hours a day in the Word. I turned into this like superhuman crazy sponge that I could devour so much of the Word and it wasn't enough. And I could go back and do it. And then I would spend the rest of the day meditating and praying. And this is where I was at. One night I went to sleep. I had spent that night late in the Word. I was in the Word of God. And... Um, in the middle of the night, I, I began to dream. I began to have this dream, or I would call it an actual vision, and you'll understand why. And in the dream, I pictured a building just like this, where it was cedar, it was wood, it was pitched. But I was at the back, and I was looking up towards the front, and service was not, service was over, I don't know what was going on. But there were some people at the front and I immediately was told that I am to go speak the name of Jesus over this woman up at the front. And in the stream, this was so vivid. And over the stream, I immediately go, I'm going to go speak the name of Jesus, Yeshua, 
over her. And as I begin to walk down the aisle, all of a sudden, out of every orifice, out of every area, I could feel demons. They're just coming up on top of me. And what was happening was, as every step I got, it got heavier. And they were doing something. Wrapping their arms around me. Right here. I couldn't speak. So as I'm going down, I'm trying to speak the name of Yeshua over this particular woman who was in bondage, who was an impression, and all these demons would not let me speak. Now that would be like, you might think, well, Danny, that's a really intense dream. Well, it gets a lot more intense when you wake up and you're still in it. And I could feel them, and I couldn't speak. I start running around my house. I don't know what to do. All I'm trying to do is get the name of Yeshua out of my mouth at this point. I mean, my whole game changed. And the second I said, Jesus, gone. All of it. Amazing. Now, I... That dream was with me every day for I can't tell you how long. And I, I, I was struggling with what does it mean? I knew immediately this is all about the power of His name. And I understood the power of His name. But then you get into, I had no idea I'd be called into ministry later on. And that, that, that is what I'm called to do. is the power of His name. To proclaim to people. Set the captives free. And understand something. You're called to the very same thing. This is what we are called as the body of Messiah. We are called to proclaim His name. There is power. Believe it. Believe there is power in His name. When you pray and you get on your knees and you say the mighty name of Yeshua, there is power. Now, let's get back to our story. How do the apostles... Respond to this command because, again, we've got to learn from this. We've got to learn. Verse 19, and Peter and Yochanan answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God you judge. I love that. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. End of discussion. They're not going to cater to their request. And we go on to verse 21. So when they had further threatened them, further, they're moving farther, they further threatened them and let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. You need to learn from what just happened here. Make no mistake, the enemy is going to attempt to intimidate you. He's going to attempt to threaten you, to sow fear into your hearts so that you do not speak that name. The power of that name. Do not cave to his intimidation tactics. Don't give in to discouragement. Don't allow him to paralyze you with things that you have done in your past that you haven't forgiven yourself for. Where Satan keeps reminding these things, these horrible things that you've done in your past, he keeps bringing them to the service and he's spiritually paralyzing you. Embrace the power of his love. Embrace the power of his forgiveness. Don't let Satan have power over you. Understand, Yeshua is far more powerful. Hide in the shadow of his wing. Walk in victory because of who he is and what he did. Not one of us understand. If you're being plagued by whatever you've done in the past lifetime, there's not one of us that are justified to stand before Yeshua. It is only in Him that we have the right to come to the Father. Amen? I'm going to close with this final, one of my favorite passages in Scripture, and it really captivates today's message. Very simple. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Mashiach, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. We're going to end here if the music team can come up. If anyone has a need for prayer or you know somebody that needs prayer, let's pray. I'll be up here. We'll have many other people up here. Please come up and keep in mind when you come up the power of our Lord. Amen?